We're going to continue our study in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. We are now dealing with uh, the second beast that comes out of the earth. We just have a few verses left in this chapter, and we will conclude it at the completion of uh, the last few verses of chapter 13. We'll begin the next session in Revelation uh, chapter 14. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I don't need to read all the verses up to where we're left at. Uh, we'll just continue from where we left off yesterday. Um, I want to go back. I meant to include this um, into the earlier discussion of the origins of the second beast, which we know to be the false prophet. Of course, we know he's called this, the, the second beast here because everything that we see about this beast, that second beast that rises out of the earth, right? Um, when you say false prophet, it has the tendency of, of suggesting that this is like a, a human human being almost, right? But the nature of this false prophet is, as it's described here, is this a second beast that rises up, the second beast, right? Uh, he causes people to uh, worship the Antichrist, to serve them as God. He deceives them with signs and wonders and uh, miracles and things like that, all for the purpose of getting people to then make an image to the uh, to the to the first beast, the Antichrist, and then puts a spirit in this um, image and brings this image to life. And then this this image then begins to speak and makes a decree: if you don't worship me, you know, uh, you'll be killed. Things like that. So we see that that's the beast nature, right? Of this of this um, of this false prophet is really acting as a beast. Uh, the question uh, that I've that I've heard about the origin of the Antichrist rising up out of the sea and the false prophet arising out of the earth, they've used, at least as it relates to some of the studies that I've, I've listened to, preachers I've listened to and prophets that I've listened to discuss Revelation dealing with uh, the origin of the Antichrist rising out of the sea. Many have said that, the I don't know why, but they're saying that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish and the scriptures that they quote is that they is that they quote Genesis chapter 49, verse 16 through 18. I'm off topic here, but I meant to throw this in when I was dealing with the Antichrist rising out of the sea and the and the second beast, the false prophet arising out of the earth. But uh, sometimes I just forget to include certain things. But now I want to bring it in before we move on. Right. Uh, and they they reference that the Antichrist is now coming from, is now gonna rise out of the tribe of Dan. And you may not be familiar with it, but if you if you go on YouTube now and start listening to the current teachings on the Antichrist, many of them believe now and are teaching now, I guess once one starts teaching it, they all start teaching it or something, right? They're now teaching that the Antichrist is gonna rise from the tribe of Dan. And they're quoting this uh, from Genesis chapter 49, verse 16 through 18, and also Judges, and Joshua and things like that. But I'm not going to list all these scriptures down here because this is a side note here, right? And so um, when Josh, when Jacob is putting a blessing over his sons, right? he goes through all of his sons, the 12 sons of Jacob, he goes through and he starts blessing them all, right? And then he puts the blessing over the tribe of Dan or, or over Dan, and this is the blessing, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel, right? And so one of the, the this could mean that, that this is speaking of Samson. Samson was of the tribe of Dan. Well, we know well, what Samson did, of course, you know, he laid with like a Jezebel type woman and stuff like that, All right? Um, but then this could also represent, uh, some are saying that this represents the false, uh, the, the antichrist. But if anything, I would think that this speaks of more of the second beast or the false prophet, right? Because the false prophet, as we've read, uh, we've read some scripture that said that the false prophet's purpose is to prove the people to see if they love the Lord and if they will serve him with all their heart and all of their soul and all their mind, right? And so in that sense, this would also mean that Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Could this be a reference more so to the false prophet, right? Rising up out of the earth. And before I've said, I believe that earth is uh, the same word as land, and I believe it's reference to the promised land or the or Israel, land of Israel, rising up out of the land of Israel. 
But for some reason, more have have said that more. There's been teachings that have said this relates to the Antichrist, and I would think more so to the false prophet. If you want to interpret this to mean that, he goes on. Though Jacob begins to continue to bless, put a blessing over his son Dan. He says, "Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so that the rider shall fall backward." Now, this is one of the scriptures that they really use uh, teachers today, teachers of prophecy, prophets and things like that, teaching in the book of Revelation, that they say, oh, this represents that the Antichrist is going to come from, from out of rice, from out of Israel, because, oh, there's the serpent, right? Dan shall be the serpent in the way. So it means that uh, out of the nation of Israel is going to come up this serpent, right? And uh, he's going to be an adder in the path. So he's going to get people to go off the pathway and to fall back, right, uh, and to be destroyed. Uh, and so they, many will say, many are now saying, that, oh, this represents the Antichrist. But if anything, again, I keep saying that this may actually, if anything in reference to um, the second beast rising up out of earth may represent that could this be then that this false prophet rising up out of the earth, could it be then from the tribe of Dan, right? Um, and this reference to the serpent is like, a Dan is gonna be like a serpent, like the serpent in the Garden of Eden, causing uh, men to, mankind to disobey God, right? Um, if you go back and look at the history of Dan, many have not, you know, but for those that have, you'll know that Dan was, as a tribe, was not faithful to the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Even when in the book of Joshua, you go into the book of Joshua and you look at the tribe of Dan, they were unable to occupy their portion of the promised land that was given to them in the land of Canaan, right? So all the tribes were given the lands and they had to go out and they had to fight and get their land. Dan was the one that was unable to occupy their land. And I believe that Dan eventually ended up on, in ships. You know, they completely just de left the promised land and they were in ships now. And I, there's reference to that. I didn't put any of that down there, but I, I do recall that. All right. Um, and if you continue to study in the book of Judges, the tribe of Dan ended up turning to idolatry before all the other nations as well. Dan also did some other things that were abominable as well, which I'm not referencing here because it's just a side topic here. And so based on all of this here, somehow people still think that uh the antichrist is going to rise from out of israel through the tribe of dan when clearly we've just already read scriptures that the antichrist is going to be a gentile uh uncircumcised he's going to rise from out of the sea of course we know the sea represents um nations and tongues and peoples but collectively uh gentiles are those that don't believe in god right or have a knowledge of god or or obeys the laws of god all right, and so then it goes on to verse 18 of J Jacob's blessing over, uh, over Dan, is that I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. And so here we see this, uh, this promise, though, uh, that uh, the salvation of the Lord is going to come to the tribe of Dan, but it is, it's going to wait. It's not something that is going to be immediate. It's something that's going to take some time to occur because Dan is going to go, so he's going to be a serpent in, a, an, uh, in the path, right? Causing many to fall. That's what it means by uh, an adder in the path that by the horse's heel so that the rider shall fall backward. That Dan is going to be the source that's going to cause many to fall out of the way, right? Off the path, out of the way. Uh, and so Jacob's, Jacob's blessing uh, by, this, by the Holy Spirit, after knowing he's going to be a serpent that's going to lead people astray, cause people to go astray, and is going to go astray himself, disobedient to the word of God. But Dan, um, Jacob puts a blessing, part of his blessing is that he, he is long waiting for the salvation of Dan, but it will come. But he's going to wait. It's going to be something that is not going to be immediate. He's going to go off and go astray, but eventually the salvation of the Lord is going to come back to him. And we know that to be true because one, when we look in the book of Revelation chapter seven, uh, when the 144,000 were being sealed, we noticed that Dan was not present, right? Um, <clears throat> and could that be that because out of the tribe of Dan uh, is going to come the false prophet arising out of the earth, right? Uh, but we know then that in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 48, it does now then include 
Dan in the millennium reign of Christ. All right, so we know that the salvation returns to Dan and Dan is brought back into the fold to have fellowship according to the promise uh, that God gave to Abraham uh, as well. So that's just the side note. I, I'm going to later move that back up to when we start dealing with, again, when we look at this, the, the, the second beast arising out of the earth and kind of put that in that section uh, about what's the origin of this uh, and the second beast arising out of the earth, which I do believe it's Israel, could it be from the tribe of Dan? That's something that uh, I'm just throwing out here. For those who want to look into that, it's definitely something that uh, sounds possible, but it's definitely incorrect to say that out of the tribe of Dan will arise the Antichrist. And that is what people are teaching a lot today, is that the Antichrist will come out of the tribe of Dan. Again, more so, I believe it would be the false prophet or the second beast. All right, so let's just get back to Finishing up the last few verses in Revelation chapter 13. So we're still dealing with uh, the second beast, the false prophet. At this point, he has done great wonders, uh, caused the people to believe. Uh, and then he has then caused them to make an image to the beast, to the first beast that had a deadly wound uh, and did live. Right. And then we read then that he causes the, uh, the image that they made to both speak and then cause them that would not worship the image to be killed. And so this is where we continue on. Uh, verse 16, it says, And he causeth all, both great and both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. All right. So this is now, this, this he that we're talking about here is referring now to the second beast of the false prophet. Previously, we were talking about, let me just back up a little bit here. We were talking about, and he, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 15, he says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that he is speaking again of the second beast or the false prophet, right? But then we noticed that when it said in verse 15, that the image of the beast should both speak and, so that both is a tie to what the image of the beast does. It both speaks and it causes as many as would not worship the image of the beast, that they should be killed. So the life that's given, or the spirit, we said it was a spirit. That word life is talking about spirit. An evil spirit was put into this image by the, uh, by the second beast or the false prophet to cause it to be able to speak. And then it caused them, uh, as many as it would not worship it, that they should be killed. Then it goes back then to the, uh, to the false prophet then the false prophet, and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So let's talk about uh, the he there. We said that is talking about the second beast of the false prophet, not so much of the image uh, that can speak and also has life and, and causes things to happen as well. Right. The, and it says to receive a mark. Right. I'm uh, the rich and poor and bond and free, that's just letting us know that um, he has a political, he reigns over the entire political system, right? All people. So that's a political system. He, he this is a, he sets up, the false prophet is able to, to, con, to bring into unity or conformity or submits, submits the political system of the Antichrist. Uh, in, in a religious system. He brings the political into the religious system, right? So whether you be great or small, and that means that great, uh, meaning both um, you as an individual, but you as your stature in the community or whatever is, you know, you had, you could be a prince or a king or a doctor or whatever, does a lawyer, whatever, or you could be small, meaning that you could be a child as well. Um, or you can just be a, a pauper in the streets, a homeless person, right? But he he covers everyone in, in the world in a political system. He brings them into a religious system. So he, he, he brings them into political systems to bring everyone into a religious system. So everything that we're looking at here, all the political systems that we see in the world are going to be dissolved into a religious system, which is satanic worship, worship of the Antichrist, and things like that. And we're going to see it into it. Right now, we know we got Republicans, we've got Democrats, we've got liberal, uh, 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 radical liberals and all that stuff. All that stuff is going to be brought to one end 
and to, to an end, and it's going to be brought into one religion, uh, one political system that's going to be brought into a religious system, which is just going to be the worship of Satan, right? The worship of the Antichrist. And that's what basically what we're seeing here. But it says he causes them to receive a mark, right? And the, this word receive a mark, that mark, when you look it up, it means a brand or a seal, right? And we know that that brand, that brand or that seal basically is a guarantee that you're going to be um, sent to the lake of fire with brimstone, sulfur and brimstone. Just like uh, the seal that the body of Christ is given, it is the earnest of our expectations uh, to receive eternal life and all the blessings that come with our salvation in Christ, including eternal life, right? We have a seal that's given to us. Right, this mark or this brand or the seal that's given to them, it is the seal that guarantees them eternal life in in the lake of fire, that with sulfur and brimstone. But this is not the first time that uh, mentions of brands or seals or markings is mentioned in, in the Bible in the Old Testament. Many are familiar with the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, speaking of cuttings or marks or branding in the flesh. Uh, it says in Leviticus 19 and 28, ye shall not make, ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Right. So here, um, even in the Old Testament, and this may have been a foreshadowing of the things that, that are to come, but definitely it was relevant for the paganism uh, and hedonism and the and worship, demonic worship of a false false gods that were going on in the land of Canaan, right? They were in specifically instructed there not to make any cuttings or receive any marks or any kind of brands or any kind of seals in their flesh for the dead, nor print. So that word print is like uh, branding, sealing, tattooing, or anything like that. Those do not make any marks because he says, I am the Lord. Like your body is a temple of the Lord. You are dedicated to the service of God. Your body is not dedicated to giving to anything else, to display anything, to worship anything. You're not supposed to be associated with anything other than the Lord. He says, I am the Lord. Everything goes, goes, goes to him. All right. In Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, right, it shows that markings are common. God marks his own. So here what's happening here is that the Antichrist um, and the false prophet are working together. Right to mark their own, right the evil transgressors and the the abominables and things stuff like that. But God also marks His own as well. We see that throughout the Book of Revelation, uh, Ezekiel chapter nine verse four in the Old Testament. It says, "And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh." and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. This is actually talking about before Babylon, well, before the nation of Israel is getting ready to be destroyed by uh, a foreign country um, because of their idolatry and stuff like that. Uh, Ezekiel was writing how God told uh, an angel to come and put a mark on all of those that cry for abominations, that really have a heart toward righteousness, and they hate seeing the unrighteousness, and they're crying out for it, and they, they hate it. Right. And so God sends, I think he believes, I think he sends like an angel there to mark the foreheads right, of those that are his own, that uh, that hate about the abominations that are going on in the land, that that hate the unrighteousness that's going on in the land. All right. So he marks them. So marking is not something that is uncommon. So as the God marks his own, the Antichrist through the work of the false prophet is allowing the false prophets to put a mark on those that belong to the Antichrist, that belong to the Antichrist, that belong to Satan. So there is a marking that is going on to identify those that are with God and those that are with uh, the Antichrist and with Satan. All right, in Exodus chapter 13, verse 9 and verse 16, right, um, there's this... Um, one of the ordinances that they have is that they have to eat seven days of unleavened bread. Um, and the eating of the unleavened bread is, is a symbol that they're not supposed to partake in sin, right? And there's seven days of just divine perfection of just not being in sin and having partaking of sin, right? Um, and in Exodus chapter 13, verse 9 and 16, I'll, I'll, I'll read it quickly here. It says, and it shall be a sign unto thee 
upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth for with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt and it shall be a token verse 16 it shall be a token upon thy hand and for frontless between thy eyes for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought us out of Egypt so there's this there's this um ordinance that that Israel was having to do and this ordinance was associated with them being separated and not partaking in sin, but being set apart. And their separation from sin was symbolized as a sign upon their hand and a sign upon their forehead. It says here, it says, um, between thy eyes, but that's talking about the forehead, right? And it's a sign that the Lord had delivered them, had brought them out of Egypt. So here we see this, this fellowship, this lack of not participating in sin, separating themselves from sin and having seven days of fellowship of uh, of the in, in the unleavened bread which ultimately represents christ or whatever right here we see this is completely opposite of what the antichrist is doing here the antichrist this symbol that is upon their hand and the symbol that is going to be on their forehead is not a symbol of them having fellowship with the with the lord's law or that them being delivered out of Egypt, it's actually the opposite. It's them being brought into Egypt. It's them not, it's them being, have, it's them having fellowship and participation in sin, right? Uh, and going back into Egypt and into the bondage of sin and darkness. So we see a symbolism here that on one hand, Exodus God is showing how fellowship with him, fellowship with his word, right? as associated with a sign upon the hand and upon the forehead. And we see the reverse of that, which means that this sign in the hand and sign in the forehead that we're going to talk about here is them being joined to sin and joined to a bondage in Egypt, not being delivered out of it, but being given back into bondage of uh, in Egypt and Babylon, like that says right here. All right, so we'll just keep on moving here. Uh, let's talk about the mark. The mark is identification with the beast, as we were just trying, to, as I was trying to show you uh, in the previous verse that we read in Exodus, that this mark is an identification with the beast and everything that the beast represents. Right, this mark is a fellowship, is identification with his mind, his thoughts, his speech, his mouth, and also fellowship with him as well. This seven days of the unleavened bread that we're talking about, it was a fellowship. Seven days of fellowship of un eating and partaking of the unleavened bread. It's a fellowship. So this marking of the hand and marking of the forehead, it means that you're having fellowship. Your mind is um, not renewed, but it's completely given over to the world, right? And you have fellowship with all of the works of darkness, right? That the, that the Antichrist has fellowship with. And all, he's the son of perdition, right? Of all of apostasy and abomination and perversion that he has that you have fellowship with that as well right and so when you look at revelation chapter 14 verse 11 it talks more about what this mark is it says uh, revelation chapter 14 verse 11 it says that it's not just the mark it's the mark of his name right we're going to read that a little uh a little later and when you read Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, it says more about the mark. Uh, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So that name that we're talking about is everything that is identified with the Antichrist. This mark is associated with that, a fellowship that you identify with, you belong to. Um, your mind and your fellowship and your strength are all given to the Antichrist to participate in all of the sin and perversion that goes along with the Antichrist. Now, when we talk about uh, the name, the name of something is reference to the, its character and its actions. So speaking of the, the character and actions of the beast. So that means you are, and when you take that mark, that means you are along with it. You, you want the character, you agree with the character of the Antichrist, and you agree with the actions of the Antichrist. You, know, you are in step with him working together, right? It means you also, you, uh, the name, uh, you approve of what he does. You promote what he does. You participate in all of the same unrighteousness that the Antichrist participates in and does. Right, that you accept the the satanic and demonic nature, uh, you, that you that you have the beast nature as well. You identify with the beast nature and the satanic nature. Right, that's what putting this mark means. That's what's happening here. 
Like you refine, you have a mouth of great blasphemy, just like the Antichrist does. You are now saying, yeah, I have a mouth of great blasphemy and I will blaspheme as the Antichrist blaspheme. And I will be lawless, right? Law, lawlessness he's talking about here is disobeying all of the laws of God. Like I will be disobedient to all the laws of God. That's what this taking this mark is all about here, right? Uh, when it speaks of the hand, the reason why it talks about the hand, the hand uh, in word study is talking about is the will of the person is joined with the Antichrist, right? That's what the hand is. That you are joining your will with the purpose of the Antichrist. You're putting your hand with his hand to accomplish his will and his purpose, to do what he does, right? To participate in what he participates, to further and promote what he promotes. That's what that hand, the hand represents. What the forehead represents, it represents the mind of a person being joined with the mind and purpose and thoughts and deeds and imaginations and perversions of the Antichrist, right? So when we read scriptures all throughout the book of Revelation, even um, uh, the, the letters uh, to the seven churches, often there's uh, references to that he'll put his name upon our foreheads and stuff like that. That just, that's talking about, and it, it's also, that's also talking about that um, our mind has been renewed such that we have the thoughts of God. We, we think the way God thinks. Um, uh, everything the way that God thinks, thinks, moves in love, thinks in love, has all thoughts of like love and peace and joy. And like, that's how we think as well. We are, our minds, we have the minds of Christ. The scripture says we are to renew our minds daily, uh, that we are to have the mind of Christ, things like that. And so uh, when he says he's able to put his name upon our forehead and put the name of his God upon um, the name of his, Jesus speaking, saying, I'll put the name of my God upon our foreheads. That's just basically saying that we think like how God thinks. We've been renewed through after the mind of Christ has been given. We think the way God thinks. We think the way Christ thinks. We have the same purpose, you know, things like that. Right? We are joined with the Father and the Son. And in our minds, we think the same, right? Uh, have, think of mercy and think of peace and have good thoughts and all anything that is virtuous and a good report. We think on those things, how the Father and the Son think. That's how we think as well. Well, this is what it says a mark upon the forehead. They think the way the Antichrist thinks, right? right? Their mind is not renewed, <laughs> you know, uh, after the mind of Christ, right? Their, their minds are after the mind of the Antichrist and their thoughts and their intents and their purpose and their imaginations being vain and vile. That's what it's talking about. When it talks about the right, right, um, it's referring to fellowship or salvation. There's many things that we're going to talk about as a, this word right, right. Um, uh, but often, as we see here in this verse here, right is referring to fellowship or salvation. It also means that you're joined in submission to the strength and the power of the Antichrist, right? Because it's the right hand. So you're, you're combining your strength and the power of the Antichrist. And there are scriptures that talk about that Jesus sits on the right hand of the Father. That means he's joined in connection to the strength and the power of the Father. And the Father uses him as his extension of his strength and his power. All right. So that is what, when you bind yourself to the Antichrist, you're taking that mark upon your right hand. You join yourself as part of the strength and the power of the Antichrist to do his will, to do his work, right? Just like Christ does his will of the Father. He said, only do the will of my Father, right? He sits on the right hand of the Father, you know? Uh, Christ is considered the, the, the right arm of God, right, in the scriptures as well. Um, but it means fellowship. So when you look at Galatians in chapter two, verse nine, we see this reference to the right, right hand or the word right. It says, uh, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. This is um, Apostle Paul uh, speaking uh, to the Galatians, the, the church in Galatia, right? He's talking about uh, when he was converted and he went to go meet uh, the apostles that were in Jerusalem. Uh, he said that once the the apostles, James, well, James was an apostle, yeah, uh, uh, once he, when he saw James was a brother of Jesus, and when he saw Peter, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, receive the grace that was given unto me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So here we see this, this phrase of the right or the right hand means fellowship, right? So when you take this mark upon the hand that the false prophet is demanding that whether you be small or great, rich or poor, free or bond, you have to receive this mark and receive this mark in the right hand. That is a symbol of 
fellowship with the Antichrist, that you are linking yourself in fellowship with the Antichrist, just like the right hand of fellowship was given by the early apostles uh, and uh, the faithful elders, speaking of James, uh, in the New Testament church that was established here, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and to Saul. In the Antichrist, during the tribulation period, the sign on their right hand is a symbol of fellowship uh, with the Antichrist and all things associated with the Antichrist. Uh, in Psalms chapter 73, verse 23, it says, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou has holden me by my right hand. So right hand also means fellowship again. You know, uh, this is David speaking of his relationship he has with, with God, right? And with the Lord, that he's constantly in fellowship, being holden up, being, being helped. So at the same time, it's mean fellowship and it means helping, right? Helping. And so uh, those that take the mark on their hand, they are applying their strength, their power. They are helping and have fellowship with the work of the Antichrist for him to do his will, to do his work. Psalm 60, verse 5, uh, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand and hear me. So here we see um, uh, the relationship of the right hand being both fellowship, but also being salvation. And so here, when they have their stamp on their right hand, they are putting all of their trust, all of their faith in this Antichrist because he is God. They are binding themselves that he is going to be our savior. He's going to be our deliverer. He's going to be the one that's going to bring down God from his throne. Right? We're putting our faith, our worship, our trust, our salvation is going to be in the, the man of the Antichrist that the false prophet is promoting. Like he is our God. He is our deliverer. He's going to bring us salvation to, to deliver us from uh, God and Christ and the saints and, you know, and the laws of God, you know, uh, the Antichrist is going to break us free from the bonds and bounds and limitations that God has put upon us here on this earth, right? They are pledging that God, that uh, the Antichrist as God is going to be their deliverer in that sense, right? And that's what's happening here that we see here, right? So again, the hand represents the will or control of a person, right? Um, and Judges chapter 13, verse 1, just give more insight into the, what the hand means. Right? We talked about what right means, right? Uh, but now, you know, what the hand means is the will or control of the will or control of a person. Uh, in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. So the hand of the Philistines means that, that the Lord delivered the Philistines to be able to control Israel according to the will of the Philistines, that they were able to control Israel according to however they wanted to do that. The Lord delivered them into the hands. And so uh, having the symbol on the hand means that you're giving your will and your control to the Antichrist, right? You're going to work with him, uh, do whatever he calls you to do. You're delivering your, your hand over to the Antichrist to be controlled by him. You give your will to him. Your purpose is giving over to him to do whatever it is he wants you to do. Psalms 37, verse 32 to 33, it says, The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. So here we see another example of how the hand relates to the will or control. So the righteous may be, um, the wicked are watching the righteous. They're trying to slay them. But the Lord, he delivers them from the hand of the, of the righteous, I mean, of the wicked. He delivers them from the will. He delivers them from being controlled or overcome by the wicked, right? So that's what the hand represents here. I know I've kind of gone into great depths over just the right hand. But uh, all right, the other aspect that we mentioned briefly was that the forehead represents the mind, right? Uh, giving your thoughts, your your you have the same thought, uh, same imagination um, as the Antichrist, right? And so that's what the forehead is symbolizing, is that you identify with the thoughts uh, and intents of the Antichrist, right? And so, um, and it means that you belong to the Antichrist. You have the same will, same mind, same thoughts, everything, right? So mind in the sense that in association with the world and worldliness, that your mind is not renewed, right? Renewed like in Christ. Your mind is completely worldly and after things of the world, after things of darkness, unrighteousness, just like the Antichrist is. Your mind is just as perverted, just as the Antichrist is. In Revelation chapter 22, verse four, it says, and they shall see his face 
and his name shall be in their foreheads. So here, this is talking about speaking of uh, the saints. They're going to see Christ and they're going to see God, right? And he's going to put, his name is going to be in their forehead. So we see association of identification. But as you see his face and you identify with him, you're going to have the same likeness or uh, same character as he has, right? And that's why you're going to have, he's, he's going to put his name in the foreheads of the saints in the, in, uh, in the Revelation chapter 22 because they have an identi they identify with him. They belong to him. So the seal in the forehead means the mind, you have the same mind, but it also means it's an identification that you identify with them. You have the, um, uh, you, you, you see each, the, you see what, whatever's in the Antichrist, you see in your, they see in themselves, right? Whatever is in Revelation chapter 22, speaking of the saints, right? Um, when we see the father and we see the son, right? We're going to see them. We're going to identify with them. They're going to identify the father and son are going to identify with us. And we're going to identify with them fully and completely. And so much that we're going to have uh, Christ going to put his new name upon us. And the father is going to put his name upon us as well. Well, there's a separation between those, the bride of Christ and those that uh, become saved during the great tribulation period. There's a separation between um, everybody's going to have the name of God, but not everybody's going to have the name the name of Christ in their forehead. But that's that's a different topic, though. Um, but it just means that you're that there's an identification with. So the seal on the forehead is that you're identifying with Christ as well, um, in the character and in name, as well as having the same mind as well. Revelation chapter seven verse three. As is speaking of before the hundred forty four thousand are going to be sealed in. Uh, in their foreheads as well, it says, saying, hurt not the trees, neither the sea, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So we know that there's a seal that's being placed upon the foreheads, right, of the 144,000 before more of the judgments are, are poured out. Of course, we know that seal to be the seal of the Holy Spirit, and that seal is put upon their forehead. That means that these individuals now have the mind of Christ. They have the word of God given to him. They have the character of him. They identify with him that they belong to Christ. They belong to God, right? They're going to preach his word. They're given to Christ. They're, they belong to God. So that's what this seal on the forehead is a symbol of identifying with and belonging to. So those that get this mark upon their forehead, right, by the instruction of the false prophet, it means that they belong to the Antichrist now. Right? They identify with the Antichrist. They have the same thoughts and mind of the Antichrist as well, unfortunately. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, it says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's names, uh, father's name written in their forehead. So here again, we see how um, a something on the forehead here that the name of God written on their head is the symbol of identifying with and belonging to. So they, they belong to God, the 144,000 after they're killed, right? Uh, they're going to stay with the lamb and God's going to put his name upon their forehead, right? So it talks about here that uh, he, the Antichrist, causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, Right. We said that this represents that the anti that the false prophet is going to have complete political power and he's going to leverage all of that political power into a religious system that's going to cause people to worship the Antichrist. So the political system that we're seeing today is being used to force people into eventually the worship of the Antichrist. That's what the, all this political system is now being gathered into. It's going to be gathered up for the sole purpose of it being to lead people it's eventually to worship the Antichrist. And they're not going to care if you're rich or poor, if you've got uh, if you got great wealth, if you're some great football player or an athlete or a doctor, or or you're just a nobody. The political systems of this world are going to be grabbed, the, the reins are going to be grabbed by the Antichrist spirit, and it's going to gather everybody in eventually to lead them to a religious system that is to worship the Antichrist. Right. And there's no there is no escape, no amount of money that you have, no amount of education that you're going to have. You will not be able to escape that unless you participate in the rapture. <laughs> right. It goes on to say that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the name of his number. 
So not only does the false prophet set up a a political system that leads everyone to worship the uh, he leads sets a political system that leads them into a religious system to worship the antichrist he takes over the political system right it says that here it says no man that no man might be able to buy or sell and also says he has complete he takes over the economic systems of the world as well he grabs the, the only way he's able to prevent people from being able to buy or sell means that this the the false prophet has to be able then to take control over the economic system of the world. So he has complete political control. He has complete economic power and control as well. And that means that there will be no fellowship, right? Um, unless you participate in this eventual religious system. So everything is headed to a religious system. All of the financial system is headed toward a religious system, which is worship of Satan, worship of the Antichrist. All the political system that we're seeing, it's all eventually, it's gonna come become one, it's gonna head down to the worship of the Antichrist. And we see that happening now, right? You know, uh, it's it's moving that way, right? And in the absence of, 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 t of not taking this mark, you'll be absent of having, there will be no fellowship. You won't be able to interact with anything, with people, uh, with money, you will have no political power or stamina. You will have no fellowship in this world. You will be excluded out altogether. When I say no fellowship, that means that you will be completely excluded and cut off. Absolutely cut off. There will be no escape, no matter how, many, how much wealth and money or influence or power you think you have, you will be cut off from it. Right? It says, save he, has, he had the mark. Now, this mark here. We kind of talked about what a mark is already, a brand or a seal, things like that. Many have said, oh, is it a UPC code? So I put a little UPC code there, right? No, it really is not a, U a UPC barcode. So I'm saying, oh, well, it's the chip. And I got a little picture down here on the bottom right here of a little chip on small little tiny thing uh, on someone's little fingertip. Looks like the index finger, right? No, it's not really, it's not a chip either. The script is very clear. Um, when it talks about that, it is the number of the beast. It is the the beast name, right? This has to be an allegiance specifically related to the beast that's going to come about, and it comes about not now, like the UPC code is already here. These little marks, uh, these little chips and stuff like that that go into the finger. Now I'm not saying that the Antichrist is not going to take advantage of all of these things to control, manipulate, and gain information, right? But this mark does not come about until after the image of the beast is made and, and brings forth life. Then it says, then the mark comes, then, then the mark comes forth. And this mark is only specific just to the beast not to anything else at all, but specifically it points everyone directly to this beast, its name or its character, it's his number, right? But it's basically talking about it's an allegiance specifically to the beast, not an economic system, uh, not a, uh, a chip type of um, a computer type system or it is related to the beast. The beast wants everything pointing to him, right? And it comes about after this image is made. Right. Um, so it talks about here uh, the name of the beast. So whatever this this mark or this name or the number of his name is, it is basically symbolic of the actions and characters of the beast. When it talks about the name, this name is this name that's going to be put, uh, you know, it could be like a, a name that's put upon your forehead or something like that or 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 something like that. It's basically it's symbolic of the character and the actions that relate to the Antichrist. Right, it's symbolic of his purpose. Right, uh, and of course we know that it also could be a title. So when you talk about a name, a name can be a title as well. A name can be a purpose, like um, like all the names of God. The names of God reveal uh, the purpose of God. That he can, he's a healer. He's here to heal. Right. Uh, a name can be reveal the character of a person as well. Um, like we talked about the twelve tribes of of Israel. All those names, stuff like that. Uh, they they reveal the character or actions of, of of an individual, right? So the name of the beast is both talking about his character, his actions. It's talking about his purpose, right? And it's also um, that his, they're the taking the name of the beast that you're taking the identif you identify with him, right? As well as it's a title. Name is also as a title, right? And so all of that is tied into the name of the beast. That it can also you can put that on you, you know, you can, you can have the mark. You can have the name of the beast put on you or the number of his name. 
Now, the number of his name, I have no idea what that's what that means. I have no idea what the number of his name means. And I think here, when you get into uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, it says, uh, here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six, which is basically, we know that to be 666. Uh, I, I don't even have any comments or anything on this. I have some thoughts, but I think at this point, I don't know of anyone uh, that I have listened to and I fellowship with fully understands what this means here. But basically, we do know that what the Spirit is telling us and what the angel is telling John, right, as he was, as this angel was instructed by Christ, as God gave him, as God gave Christ instructions, he's saying to us here about this Antichrist and about this false prophet and about the systems of this world, where they're headed to, that we need to have, we need this word, here is wisdom. It means that we need to have a cautious character. We need to be highly in tuned and highly knowledgeable and applying all that we know about God's word, about what's being mentioned here in Revelation, uh, so that we are on guard and able to navigate ourselves through the Antichrist spirit that is rising up in the world and that is coming. There's something about what he's saying here, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It's the number of the man, uh, and his number is 666. There's something about that that we yet fully don't understand, but He's letting us know that it's important for us to understand what's going on so that we may be able to have proper application of what we're reading in the book of Revelation so that we make sure that we're able to obey the word of God with fear and reverence so that we don't fall victim to the, the Antichrist system that is being that's coming into place to set up this man, right? That's going to cause many people uh, to fall. Um, I, one thing, though, when it talks about he that understanding, let him count the number of the beast. This word count, when you first look it up, it means it starts to say uh, to enumerate, like literally counting. But then it says it goes back and it says gives a reference to um, a pebble. And then it gives another reference to it means to make a choice or decision or to have a voice. And so the the ultimate word of what this word let him that have an understanding count the number of the beasts. What this is really saying is he that have understanding, let him um, make a determination. Um, I didn't put any of these comments down because I didn't think I was going to go, go this far in, into this. I was going to save it for the next time we go through it. So I'm still working on it. Um, it means like let him make a determination, like determine who the beast is going to be and understand it, and as if, make sure you don't go down that route. Um, it's like when Jesus was talking about, if a man begins to put his hand to the plow, let him count the cost, right? Um, when you look up that count, that count is talking about, not like counting like by number, it just means make a determination. Determine um, who, this, who this beast is and what's all involved in it and make a determination of that you're not going to to be associated with that or you're going to apply the word of god in the sense that you're not like this beast uh it's hard for me to, to fully explain it uh other scriptures talk about uh paul it means like a voice as well uh, but anyway i'm going to pause it there um but if anyone, I mean, I pray about this. I was telling my wife, this man, I pray about this scripture so many times um, a day. I pray about this scripture over and over in my, in my sleep, when I'm driving in the car, always praying that, Lord, give us understanding of what this verse is, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. And I know that the Lord will, that he will. I'm not even worried about it. I've already said, Lord, I know you're going to reveal it to him. I'm going to be so happy when you finally do. And it's going to come by, by revelation, but it has to be. Uh, it's a man or a woman that's going to be filled with the wisdom of God, that's applying the word of God, uh, seeking the word of God, seeking for understanding. And he's going to bring this understanding to us what the 666 is, is all about. But anyway, I'm going to stop here.